Um, our next speaker, um, you've been walking around all evening. Rob Shetterly. His portraits are here. Um, we asked him to come and speak. And we put this portrait in front of us, Daniel Ellsberg, who just recently died, most, one of the most amazing peace activists, a very active member, by the way, of Veterans for Peace, Daniel Ellsberg. Rob Shetterly. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I always have to tell Dan to stand up straight, so I did that. Um, I'm going to be very brief. I was uh, thought of many, many things to talk about, but I'm not going to do all that. But I am going to say I was on the way down here today thinking about water. For some reason, this quote, this famous quote from James Baldwin came into my head. And I'm sure you, a lot of you know it, where he said, uh, people, who treat other people as less than human should not be surprised when the bread they have cast on the waters comes floating back to them poisoned. And this is a great indictment of racism or imperialism or many other isms like that. But it, it occurred to me at the same time that I was saying that to myself, that when people treat other people with love, with kindness, with generosity, with respect, with dignity, with honesty, then what they have cast on the water comes floating back to them like the golden rule. And uh, that was kind of what inspired me to be thinking about that. I also wanted to say one thing about just talking to a room full of people who are many of whom are uh, veterans and, and veterans for peace. I was, I mean, I'm an honorary member of Veterans for Peace. The nicest thing that ever happened to me was to be made an honorary member. But I was on the other side back in 1968 when I handed in my draft card. But at this point, uh, to be in the company of people like all of you uh, moves me enormously. And it's not, you know, it's the, it, today, and I'm sure it gives you all the shivers to when somebody does that sort of glib dismissal thing and thanks you for service. You know, what is so impressive in wanting to thank a person who has become a veteran for peace is the journey they've been on. The journey of cognitive dissonance, the journey of moral injury, the, joy, the journey of, of family dissonance, of friendship dissonance, of uh, betrayal dissonance, of all the things that happen when you move from one place that seemed to accommodate your values and your patriotism, which was all about violence, where you try to assemble those same virtues and those same values to be in the support of peace and the dissonance that causes in so many lives, including your own. And so to go on that journey is something that I am just so impressed with because anybody who could take that journey becomes almost by uh, default, a teacher. You know, a teacher of other people, and God knows we need teachers today. Um, which makes me think that the thing I really wanted to talk about was, was something that has to do with teaching. On um, March 19th, 2003, I did something that I'm guessing that some of the people in this room also did, or probably in, in different places all over the place. But we're involved in some kind of demonstration or civil disobedience because that was the day the Iraq war started. And there was a small group of us who came into the um, um, federal building in Bangor where Olympia Snow had her office. And we sat in the lobby. We couldn't get upstairs to her office, so we just sat in the lobby and stopped any traffic in the building. And we were sitting there for some time doing this little civil disobedience thing when um, one of the group said, oh, we should be singing. And he started singing, um, I'm only asking that we give peace a chance. And that, you know, we should have had, here's Pat. We should have had Pat with us that day. 
Um, for some reason, that has stayed with me and bothered me enormously ever since then. There was something about being so importunate, this sort of plea to a very corrupt government, a government that was committing war crimes, a government that was lying, you know, to be asking them in such a sweet, humble way to bring peace when we should have been demanding it and doing more than we were doing. And I've been thinking ever since then that, um, you know, one of the reasons for these portraits, and they're now 270 of these portraits and they travel you know, all over this country to museums and colleges and libraries and things. But the intention of them is to be a much stronger statement than please give us peace. It's to demand an end to racism, to demand uh, peace, to demand the end of corruption in our own government. And uh, I think that the, you know, of all the things that could do, whether they're as great as the kind of whistleblowing that Daniel Ellsberg did, um, or just, um, you know, the simple teaching of the courage of Veterans for Peace, but it involves so much about education. What makes it so hard, you know, to build a peace movement, I think, is not as some of you saw them out there is a portrait of Coleman McCarthy, the sort of father of peace studies in this country. Um, you know, he, and he often says that the problem with us here is that we have, uh, you know, a culture that's illiterate about peace, that our children are illiterate about peace. We don't teach peace. And, you know, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, you know, the founder of the, uh, the Children's Lobby, uh, said, um, I mean, she asked this sort of rhetorical question, what's wrong with our children? It's adults telling children to be honest when they're lying and cheating. It's adults telling children to be nonviolent when they're marketing and glorifying violence. I believe adult hypocrisy is the biggest problem that children face in America. You know, I've been in hundreds of classrooms around this country, college, high school, middle school, and talked about Marianne Wright Edelman and recited that quote. And I've never met a single kid who said that wasn't true. Mm. Not one. That's pretty scary. But it points to the problem that we don't teach peace. You know, we teach violence. We teach it you know, explicitly and we teach it implicitly. And, and how to change that culture, how to make a culture of peace, all depends on how we're going to teach peace and demanding that, teach, that peace be taught in our schools at all different levels. Otherwise, I don't know how we're ever going to come to a place where we become a true culture of peace. I'm going to go on and on about different people here. I hope you take the time to read, to meet some of these people. A lot of you know who they are and read their quotes. And uh, I realize, I think, you know, how important they are. Each one is meant to stimulate you to think and then to act in some way. And I hope you will. Thank you very much. Right now, Helen Descartes is looking at her phone. She doesn't realize that I'm calling her to the microphone right now. <laughs> Helen Jacquard is the director of the Golden Rule Project. She is the driving force, the brains behind all of this stuff going on for miles and miles and months and months. Helen Jacquard. I've ever been in front of. This is great. Why are we all here? We're here to start out with because we need to recognize the human cost of the nuclear era. We need to recognize that the first victims and most of the victims have been black and brown people. Starting out with the people that were bombed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki continuing on with the people that were, whose land was destroyed and their whole culture and way of life and way to get their food was destroyed in the Marshall Islands through nuclear weapons testing. 
The people in Nevada exposed to the first nuclear bomb, the Trinity bomb. Mostly brown people, mostly indigenous people on our lands. And that continues. We have the, the mills that have the tailing ponds. We have 15,000 abandoned uranium mines on indigenous land just in our own country. And then we have the meltdowns. And where do we put the waste? Where are we proposing to put the waste? We put the waste where there's not as many people. And that's where the indigenous people live in our country. We need to recognize the dangers that we're in right now. The, the war in Ukraine represents a, a significant chance that we could end up in a nuclear war with Russia. We're surrounding China with our weapons and threatening them with war over the territory of Taiwan. India and Pakistan are already threatening each other with nuclear war. They have many times. So we need to think about what the Red Cross, Red Crescent, and Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons has came to through their studies of what could happen with even a limited nuclear exchange, where 100 <coughs> nuclear weapons would produce enough soot and ash in the atmosphere to block out enough sunlight to reduce crop failure for about 10 years. But that crop failure would result in famine that would starve 2 billion people. And that's just a small limited nuclear exchange with the number of weapons that exist in India and Pakistan alone. So what can we do? Well, I would like to welcome you all to the Golden Rule family. Now you are all part of the number of people that are working to disarm the entire planet. What we do as the Golden Rule is educate. We do a little bit of protest, but mostly our mission is to educate. We educate our politicians. So we ask them to sign resolutions in favor of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and the other back from the brink measures that include taking the president's sole authority to launch a nuclear strike. Get that, get rid of that. We're, we're making weapons to the tune of $2 trillion. We're modernizing every aspect of the nuclear arsenal in the United States. And that could be done away with. We're making weapons that, while well, we say a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, and yet we're putting $2 trillion into that, does that make sense? No. And the workers and the shareholders, is that the way they want their life energy to be used? Weapons of mass destruction, I don't think so. So in part of our education, We've been doing things like when we came down the Mississippi River and we visited Dubuque, Iowa, there's a group of 800 or 1,000 Marshallese people that live there. Mm. They didn't even know about what happened in 1958, that the Golden Rule was headed there to stop the nuclear weapons tests. And when they found out about 1958 and that we were going to visit their town, wow, did they show up and give us a great welcome. We all were celebrating and crying and holding on to each other. It was fantastic. When we were down at the tip of Florida, we went and visited Cuba and reminded ourselves and others about the Cuban Missile Crisis and some of the similarities between the Cuban Missile Crisis and what's been going on in Ukraine now. And we visited Washington, D.C., which was really exciting. You know, it was our only opportunity ever to be in the nation's capital. What we did, we passed out the Veterans for Peace Nuclear Posture Review. And this is our version of it. We analyzed the relationship between the United States and all of the other nuclear armed countries and Iran. And we figured out that diplomacy could end all this nonsense. And so if you want to look for the Veterans for Peace Nuclear Posture Review, you'll see that it's a really great document with a lot of good recommendations. And we passed out a copy of that to every member of Congress and every member of the Senate. Yeah.
And then when we were um, in New York, we got to visit the United Nations. Mexico is hosting the next meeting of states parties for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This will be the second one. And this is in November. They're going to host it in New York instead of in, in, in Mexico so more people can come. Anyway, so the Mexican embassy invited not only the Golden Rule team, but also 13 other countries to come have a meeting. And they were delighted. Normally, it's like state to state. We talk this high level gobbledygook, right? They got to talk to real people about nuclear disarmament. It was a really fun meeting. And then right after that, we got to go to the Republic of the Marshall Islands um, and talk with the, or, um, what do you call it, embassy. And man, that woman, the, the ambassador there, she gave us two hours of her time and we talked and talked and talked about what had happened in 1958, what's going on now with the Compact of Free Association, which is the relationship between the United States and the people of the Marshall Islands. And that compact is being renegotiated and extended. This is how the people of the Marshall Islands are able to come to the United States. They can live here and they can work here. And right as of now, they can get health care here. There was a while that they couldn't. But the Marshall Islands, you know, they get cancer from the radiation there. And there's no um, chemotherapy available on the islands. And they also volunteer for the US military more than a lot of different groups. And they don't even have a VA clinic in the Marshall Islands. So they all have to come to, to the United States. So we got to do some amazing things along our, along our route. Everywhere we go, people support us. We have, you know, this is a trip of over 100 different stops, probably an average of maybe four meetings per, per trip. So, you know, four or 500 times. We're talking with people, showing people the boat, doing press conferences and, and welcomes and things like that. So it's a, it's a really busy time for us. It's the most ambitious year we've ever done. And I like what all you are, are doing right here. Um, what all can we do besides we can support HRES 77, which supports the back from the brink measures to, you know, ratify the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and get rid of the $2 trillion nuclear modernization program, um, declare a no first use policy and back that up by removing the warheads from the missiles, especially the ICBMs that are on hair trigger alert, <coughs> things like that. But you all are doing other things that are really important through art, through, through music, you know, through poetry and, and theater. You know, Bigelow was part of a, a play called Which Way of the Wind in 1959. That play's been revived and is being showed, shown in Humboldt Bay every year. So they put together a group of people, only takes four actors, and off they go and they talk about nuclear weapons. There's some other things that you can do besides educate and advocate for certain legislation. One thing you can do is get your city and your pension fund to divert, divest from weapons. So if you go, to, there's a um, Don't Bank on the Bomb website. You can go there and you can learn where it is you need to divest from with your, your big, huge amount of savings that you might have. I mean, I don't know, maybe you don't, but. <laughs> of course you can protest. You can write. You know, there's a lot of been, Artie um, Alpert has written three articles while we've been in this general area. So you can be an author, you can be a speaker. And you know, we started out, I was the first public speaker for the Golden Rule, and now we have several. So, you know, you can learn to speak, speak out. And I know a lot, a lot of people already do this. I know that you are out there writing and speaking already. And we do it on behalf of Veterans for Peace and the Golden Rule Project, but I know that you're there and you're out there educating people that way. And we need to think about nuclear disarmament, that issue in conjunction with a lot of other issues. War, our culture of war needs to change. War is causing climate change. It's a big factor. The US military is the biggest consumer of oil, therefore the biggest emitter of carbon dioxide on the planet. 
we need to change our, our political structure because the, the profits gained by the war profiteers is what's doing part of this damage, is what's the corruption that's caused by our political system is part of the problem, right? You get the money that goes to the contractors and they spend it on the lobbyists who use it to buy the votes. So we need to change all of that as well. I would encourage you to engage with us. Go to our website, vfpgoldenrule.org. My phone number's in there if you want it. And follow the golden rule. We also on our website, every 10 minutes, a new dot goes on a map. And so you can see exactly where we are and when we're coming to the next town. And it's got our schedule on there. So I would like to thank the thousands of people that in 1958 supported the first voyage of the Golden Rule and now are supporting the current voyages of the Golden Rule and all of you who are working tirelessly for nuclear disarmament. And more specifically, um, we're heading, the Golden Rule is heading to South Portland tomorrow, uh, where we're going to be engaging with the South Portland Council. And the next day, we're heading to Bath. And then that following day, we're going to uh, join demonstrators uh, who are, are um, confronting BIW and, 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 you know, demanding in Rob's terms, not asking, right? That they turn their manufacture of destroyers and just say, hey, hospital ships or windmills or something like that. So the Golden Rule is going to be down there in the Kennebec and there's going to be a people demonstrating um, on, on the ground and stuff like that. So please, please join us. Um, the next speaker is, is Bob Eaton, whose life of nonviolent resistance to war spans decades. Bob, where are you? I'm out in Siberia. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Come on in. Come into the war. You know, we only just met, but I'm going to be your best friend because I'm not going to take my full five minutes. <laughs> Dear friends, our lives are threads of connection as individuals and as that stunning poem that began this evening tells us of communities. And I want to draw just a quick thread in my own life. You, is this Dan up here? Yeah. What do you, yeah. Yeah. Dan, who I'm proud to call a friend, gave an interview not long before he died, very short, and the theme of it was, courage is courageous. I want to draw you a timeline in my own life and bring it up to the present. In the early 60s, I was a high school kid who was supposed to be reading Anna Karenina and said I was in the high school library reading The Voyage of the Golden Rule. Mm -hmm. And that book opened my eyes to possibilities of how to live a life. And Bert spelled it out so well, and that crew did. And one of those crew members, George Willoughby, uh, became a mentor of mine. We spent years together doing various things. And George was a CO during World War II and served in a civilian conservation corps camp. And when I tell, asked him what I should do about the Vietnam War, he said, well, I would damn well burn my draft card this time around. I took his advice and uh, actually ended up in prison. And in June of 71, we're in the day room of the prison watching the news, and there's this thing. Somebody released the Pentagon Papers and it's created a big stink. The next day, a guard walks up to me, and he wasn't hostile. He was sort of quizzical. He says, so you're the son of a bitch who did this. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? He says, they found out. You are the guy. And I said, well, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it turns out, turns out, the evening before my sentencing, 
there was, I was at a conference in Haverford College and I gave a talk to the assembled group of pacifists from the War Resisters International League that are meeting about going to prison the next day. And the following day, a friend of mine, Randy Keeler, gave another talk about how he would be going to prison in several weeks. Unbeknownst to us, in that crowd was Dan Ellsberg. And he said later that he had held on to these papers for years, knowing, what, trying to figure out what to do with them that wouldn't get him in trouble. And he felt that at that Haverford conference, he finally <coughs> realized he had to, in fact, risk getting in trouble. And the rest is history, in a way. I'm proud to say, by the way, I went on and spent 12 years of my working life with the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, the only non-military vet, but I was a vet of prison, and they liked that idea. <laughs> Courage is contagious. Dan had it right. I would add only one thing. The seedbed of courage is community. It's solidarity. It's refusing to be divided into groups against each other. And when we live in the power of that understanding, we can all be courageous. So I urge us all to lead lives of courage and to resist the war machine. Thank you. I just love that. Having been drafted myself, I go back to those days and think, man, why did I do that? <laughs> God bless your soul. Man. Next speaker is um, Sid Sewell, who is representing Physicians for Social Responsibility, who has collaborated with Veterans for Peace in making all of this stuff happen. So, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Sid. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me, and boy, tough acts to follow. A poet, an artist, a singer, historian, uh, a real peace activist. Um, so, Again, PSR Maine has really been gratified in its working relationship with Veterans for Peace and the men group. Our past president, Connie Jordan, has already been honored for her role in organizing this. And another key player was a person who's not here tonight, Doug Transfield, another one of our board members. Um, so just like Veterans for Peace, a PSR Maine does to a certain extent have Maine roots. Lewiston's Dr. Bernard Lown, who was a world famous cardiologist, was also a founding member of our national organization, Physicians for Social Responsibility, as well as using his international contacts to work up uh, um, the, the, the efficiency of international physicians for prevention of nuclear war. Uh, so again, I think it's urgent that we get our, our country to follow the state main motto, Dirago, to lead. Uh, America has to use its influence to push the nuclear armed countries in the right direction towards the reduction and gradual el elimination of all nuclear stockpiles. And to a certain extent, the Golden Rule's arrival here has all already accomplished in a, a local way uh, towards that goal. Um, last week, the Portland City Council voted to adopt the Back from the Brink resolution. Uh, we want to thank Natalie West, if she's here, uh, who was the city councilor uh, who submitted the resolution, and uh, Don Kimball, one of your folks, who did a lot of the testimony, and Jim Mello, a physician, I think also was key in getting that uh, resolution passed. Um, apparently, the testimony was very persuasive, and it was uh, uh, approved unanimously by the city council. Uh, we've talked a little about Dan Ellsberg here, whose picture is before me, and I'm totally honored to be that close to him. Uh, while he never got the Nobel Prize for shortening the Vietnam War, which he certainly did, he did kind of get an award from Nixon and Kissinger because he was labeled the most dangerous man in America, <laughs> uh, which made him a hero to, to my generation. And looking around, I guess it's our, gen our generation. <laughs> uh, 
So in an interview before he died, uh, do uh, Dr. Ellsberg also remarked that the insanity that he had documented in the Pentagon Papers was actually exceeded by the madness of our nuclear strategy um, that he was uh, aware of at the time. He had found and hidden away secret Department of Defense files that scared the heck out of him. Uh, he hoped to make them public, but apparently they were hidden in a way that made him susceptible to weather, and the files were destroyed and never got released. Um, but what they showed was that our Defense Department actually had military strategy that included plans to win a nuclear exchange, whatever that means. Uh, fully armed B-52s were always on high alert, and many were scrambled frequently in response to aberrant radar signals uh, that ended up being false alarms. So I would ask, are we any safer today? Are we any safer today? In our current world, we still face the risk, among other things, of accidental nuclear war from faulty technology, unfettered escalation from the use of tactical, tactical nuclear weapons, whatever those are, in hot conflicts that then get uh, uh, lead on to uh, international conflicts of higher levels. And in the, Af in the absence of safeguards in command and control systems, which could allow an unbalanced leader to have his finger near or on the button. And we've seen that in many countries, including our own. So the national adoption of the Back from the Brink resolution uh, would be a great first step towards a more rational strategic pop posture. And the, the doomsday clock is ticking. Uh, so we're honored, again, that the Golden Rule included Maine uh, in its route. And we're really grateful to team up with all the groups here in making this event possible. Um, I don't think we, we have two more speakers, sort of, okay. Um, one is, of course, a singer who's going to end this whole thing, Pascal. But I asked um, if some of the members of the crew would like to just come up and say a few words of what it's like for them to be on this journey. Um, and, you know, I'm not a sailor myself, but you have to think, if you, if you looked at that boat, if you walked over to that boat, and imagine four of you sleeping in that boat and being in that boat all the time. This is not some voyage of, you know, hey, it's great fun, right? This is a huge endeavor. And I'm sure it's great fun. I'm looking at the Captain Deb right now, right? And she's going, okay, all right, all right. But this is, this is an amazing uh, journey that these folks are on. So if you got, you want to just come up and say a couple of words for us, sir? This is Captain Deb. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually a middle child of five, <laughs> and so, it's, it's fine having all these people practically in the same room, but we, um, we stop at places and, you know, we're going port to port, and in many ports, uh, we're taken in, and we actually get our own room for a while. Like, thank you, Diane, for your generous um, hospitality, and she even cooks for us, you know. And, <laughs> we, we really appreciate that. And, you know, it lightens our load, but the most important thing for all of us, I think, is to to bring the word that hey, let's let's open our minds and our hearts to can we have a more peaceful world? And, and I think that's been an honor and a privilege to be part of this. And I, you know, wouldn't trade this experience for the world. I'm, I've been so pleased. I'm getting a little sad that I'll be leaving in New York to pass the baton on to Captain Kiko. Uh, did any of, of you all want to come up, the crew, to say something? Mm -hmm. Oh, we got, um, mm -hmm. I, I want to recognize that uh, Bill Good from Ohio is our first mate. <laughs> and, when we weren't getting fed in, in somebody's home or by some something wonderful like this, and thank you so much. This is 
very great. I lived here for years and I never went to DeMillo's. So <laughs> here I am. But I, he went to two years of culinary school and said, wait a minute, <laughs> I don't need to do this cooking. And he's, he's also, we're sharing the cooking. And then um, we have um, Steve Baggerly, who's from Virginia, but originally from Massachusetts. So come on over, Steve. And we have another, uh, Rhonda Reap, who's from Hawaii. I live in Hawaii now because, I'm sorry, Maine's a little bit cold for me now. <laughs> and so Rhonda teaches sailing in Hilo and just a, a natural here. But come on up, Steve, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it really is such a pleasure to be here and see how much you support peace and our efforts. Thank you. I'm Steve Bagley. I'm with the Catholic Worker in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, <laughs> and we're, we help feed and shelter people, and we work against war and nuclear weapons in the most militarized place on the planet. And it's such, a, it's such an honor for three weeks to be on the Golden Rule crew, um, to be part, to be a little small part of this Veterans for Peace effort. When I think of Veterans for Peace and their mission, I think of Dalton Trumbo's Johnny Got His Gun and the mission of the World War I soldier whose limbs were all severed by a shell, which also made him blind and mute and yet he blinks with his eyes, Morse code, to tell the people that are caring for him that what he wants to do is he wants his torso to be toured all over the country to show people what war is all about. And when I think of Veterans for Peace, I think that they have that same mission. And I know that if war is ever gonna to come to an end, a big part of it's gonna be because veterans have told the story of their experiences, veterans from, and their families from militaries all around the world. And I'd also just like to, and of course, Albert Bigelow was a veteran for peace, and I'd just like to mention one more, and I really appreciate the painting of Phil Berrigan that's on the far side. Um, he was a profound veteran for peace, and I was honored to be part of a plowshares action that he took part in in 1997 at Bath Ironworks, the Prince of Wales <coughs> plowshares on that Ash Wednesday and I'm really looking forward to going back to BIW this week. Thank you all so much for what you do and your work for this honor of the world. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, we christened a rowboat after, after Philip Bergen, so it's, we bring it to the demonstrations at BIW. Helen's got a couple of more comments here. I just wanted to thank a couple of people that have been with us for a long time that hadn't been recognized today. Zoe Bird came with us. Um, she was joined us in 2016 when she started flyering in Port Townsend, Washington, when the Golden Rule was up there. Thank you so much, Zoe. <laughs> and just like Sylvia Bigelow was a big help when Bert was doing his work, I would like to acknowledge someone who doesn't just sit around and wait, but has been my mentor for all these years, ever since I met him. My husband, <laughs> Jerry Condon. president of Veterans for Peace. He was a Green Beret who refused to go to the war in Vietnam and uh, fled and was an activist from that point on. So we are going to close with P Pat Scanlon leading us in song. And I just want to say again, one more time from the deepest part of our heart at Veterans for Peace, we really thank you all for being here, for be doing all the work that you do. Um, and you know, um, we're in it for the long haul. Right? And so uh, at, on our, at our Saturday event, we had lots of students there and young people who were feeling the same kind of passion and anger that we've got and stuff like that. And so it's, we're moving. So Pat, want to sing us? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just sing one. Okay, cool. I was, I was going to sing two, but we're getting tight, so I'll just sing the one. But I do want to say, uh, my music is part of the movement. It is free, it always has been and always will be. 
a website, patscanlanmusic.com. We can go and see two music videos. One is called Extremists for Peace, and uh, the other one is uh, War is Not the Answer. And all the songs on there are for free downloads. So it's patscanlanmusic.com. I also brought some of these with me, and until they run out, um, first come, first serve at the end if you'd like a, if you'd like a CD. Um, so having said that, I also um, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, proud to say that I spent a couple hours in a jail cell with Daniel Ellsberg many years ago. So the second thing is I have a cardiac problem. I have a stint right now. And uh, for, for years I was ignoring the, the issue and, and I came home one day and my wife said to me, uh, I found the cardiologist you go see. And I said, oh really? Why do you think I'll go see this guy? Because this guy won the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> That's Dr. Bernard Lau. Oh. And for 20 years, I was, I hope to say, his favorite patient. <laughs> but we, I would go in and he'd do all his medicine. And then we'd sit in his office and talk politics and everything <laughs> for like a half hour. And at the very end, uh, when he was, he kept me on as a special, for the, for the end, he, he had me down, down uh, sized his practice, but he kept me on. And the very last time I went in to see him, and I said, you know, I actually have a photo of him holding my banjo. But he said, uh, I said, Dr. Lown, I said, I, I pulled out my camera. I said, I really would like to get a picture of you and me together. Standing there in his white gown and white things, he reaches into his front pocket on his white apron, whatever you call the thing, and he pulled out a camera. He said, me too. <laughs> Most precious moment of my life, I think, with Dr. Lau. He was uh, w just a wonderful, wonderful human being. So. He named a bridge in Lewiston, the Bernard Lau Peace Bridge. Wow, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, he was something. So um, I'd like to get my, uh, uh, now, everyone had a big meal tonight, right? And it, it, it's good when, after you eat a meal like that we, we just enjoyed, to have um, a little bit of exercise. So this is an aerobic song for everybody. It's also a sing-along. So I would like to get my two assistants up here, if I could, my son David and Peggy, right? So, in order to get, you guys have been sitting down for a long time. Your tushes must be kind of sore at the moment. So if we could get everyone just to stand up. If, if able, if you're not able, that's okay. This is going to be a song you're going to remember. So uh, now we're going, to, we're going to teach you. Now you got the, from the first song, you, you, you were really good with the singing, right? Everybody remember? So we're going to do the same thing. Um, and, uh, but again, this is the last song of the night, so let's blow the roof off of this place, okay? So, um, this is a song that uh, has a choreography, and it goes, uh, one more thing. Hold on. Okay, so, um, are we ready? Yeah. To learn this? <laughs> Are we ready? It goes, there's no place to hide. Once the missiles fill the skies, the earth is going to die. It's too late to ask them why. It'll be over so fast. Makes no sense to cry. Just give your kid a great big hug and kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> I told you you're not going to forget it. <laughs> but we have to practice, right? Let's try it one time. Acapella. Ready? Do you think you got the words? Yeah. You gotta sing too. No place to hide once the missiles fill the skies. 
the earth it's gonna die. It's too late to ask them why. It'll be over so fast. Makes no sense to cry. Just give your kid a great big hug and kiss your ass goodbye. Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> All right, is everybody in the back doing this too? You gotta make sure, there we go, okay. So you ready to try this one time? So I, I'm gonna, hold off. I'm gonna do just a chorus one time so we, we make sure we got it, right? So it goes, two, three. There's no place to hide once the missiles fill the skies. Earth that's gonna die, it's too late to ask them why. It'll be over so fast, makes no sense to cry. Just give your kid a great big hug and kiss your ass goodbye. Oh, I wish I had a camera to get you guys. <laughs> so, all right, so that's it. So, are we ready? Hey, buddy, what are you gonna do when the war begins, man? <laughs> What are you going to do when the bomb falls? When the bomb falls. All right. <laughs> what are you doing when the bomb falls? It's been a long night for Doug. I understand. So, well, I'm a survivalist and I'm a going to survive. After Armageddon, friend, well, I'll be alive. I've been through my training, got my ammo and gun. If my neighbor comes looking to help, I'll shoot that son of a gun. But there is no place to hide once the missiles fill the skies. Earth is gonna die, it's too late to ask them why. It'll be over so fast, makes no sense to cry. Just give your kid a great big hug and kiss your ass goodbye. Well, I've built me a shelter, put it deep in the ground with concrete. Green and steel, I've made it safe and sound, filled with food and water for our civil defense. And around my bomb shelter, I put barbed wire fence, but there is no place to hide once the missiles fill the skies. The earth is gonna die, it's too late to ask them why. It'll be over so fast, makes no sense to cry. Just give your kid a great big hug and kiss your ass goodbye. Well, then I'll move my family to the southern hemisphere. Australia, New Zealand, the bomb won't hurt us there. And radiation can't hurt us when we're far across the sea. Besides, I ain't afraid of nothing, friend, that I cannot see. But there is no place to hide once the missiles fill the skies. The earth is gonna die, it's too late to ask them why. It'll be over so fast. Makes no sense to cry. Just give your kid a great big hug and kiss your ass goodbye. Well, prevention is the only thing on which we must agree. For this armament and world peace, this I do believe. From nuclear war, then be no hiding place. Prevention is the only thing will save the human race. Cause there is no place to hide once the missiles fill the skies. The earth is gonna die, it's too late to ask them why. It'll be over so fast, makes no sense to cry. Just give your kid a great big hug and kiss your ass goodbye. But there is no place to hide once the missiles fill the skies. The earth is gonna die, it's too late to ask them why. It'll be over so fast, makes no sense to cry. Just give your kid a great big hug and kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> I hope somebody got that on film. <laughs> hey, everybody. Go in peace. Thanks for being here. Right. Don't forget to get your ticket stamp, by the way, so you don't have to pay for parking. Take care.